We're here today at the Museum of the Gulf Coast Sports Hall of Fame to interview Jeff Hayes. My name is Sam Monroe, and I serve as president of the Port Arthur Historical Society. Jeff's family has had such a significant impact on developing Port Arthur, Beaumont, Orange, this area, through the years in housing and real estate, uh, in commercial construction, retail construction, and ownership. They have employed so many people through the decades and made it possible for people to improve their positions in life by having a good paying job. Jeff's father, Roy Hayes, Lloyd Hayes, Joe Hayes are gone. We're happy to have Jeff here today. Jeff, thanks so much uh, for doing this. We appreciate uh, your many personal contributions to the community through time. I'd like to ask you to start. Uh, my recollection is your family is from Oklahoma. Will you start uh, with when your mother and father first came to Port Arthur? Yes. Uh, my mother and father, my dad was from a little Indian town called Ninnikaw, Oklahoma. That's south of Chickasha. And all of this happens south of Oklahoma City. And my mother was from a little town close to that, Elek, A-L-E-X, Oklahoma. And I won't belabor it right now, but my dad was a pretty good basketball player. And even then, they were recruiting ball players. So they recruited him to spend his 11th year in high school and he played basketball for LA Oklahoma and my mother was a student there and used to go to the ball games and my dad was pretty good so to go to LA they got him a job at the drugstore they gave him a place to live and that's uh, he was sending money back to his mother because his dad had died with the flu in January of 1919. So my mother went to college up in Edmond and was teaching school. And my dad had worked a little bit in the panhandle of Oklahoma on oil rigs. And then they eloped and my dad started selling cars in Ardmore, Oklahoma. And I won't belabor the point, but a friend of his would give him city directories because he wanted to move someplace. And she was the secretary at the Chamber of Commerce. And she called him one day and said, I got two city directories in there today. If you want to take them home with you, one is Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the other one is Port Arthur, Texas. Of course, he'd heard of Albuquerque, but he hadn't heard of Port Arthur, Texas. He took them home and based on those, he didn't know anybody in Port Arthur. They came to Port Arthur on December the 16th, 1931. And that's when the old Beaumont Highway, some people call it 347 today, uh, they got out there and this was about 11 o'clock at night and it was raining and the highway was up high but as you know it can get mighty wet around here and my mother looked out and saw all that water and she said Roy we've hit the Gulf of Mexico so he got a job as a manager of a small loan company and later uh, that was in 31 they lived above McClellan's, which was in the 500 block of Proctor Street, had stairways above that store, and that's where they first lived in Port Arthur. And in 33, he got a job in a real estate company called C.O. Dumb, and that's when he actually started in business. Uh, he actually went over there in 32, started his own business in 31. I mean, 33, excuse me. He had been working for Mr. Dunn when they were selling lots, were they? Yes, in Boar Gardens. And Hazel Barron 
was the secretary for Mr. Dumb. And she called him up and said, we need an additional salesman. They were selling lots, especially on Sunday afternoon. And my dad said, well, I'll do it. They ended up with eight salesmen out there that day. They sold 12 lots all together, and my dad sold eight of them. So he, my dad was a pretty good salesman. He had a gift of gab. I knew your father, and uh, he had so much, he was so quick and could size up a situation so well. Uh, he was amazing. I, I, he had the great sales ability you talk about, and uh, he was highly respected for that. Well, he, he did a good job. Uh, you know, the, the Port Arthur Land Company bought 43,000 acres around 1895. And uh, we ended up putting together 8,000 acres of those, of that 43. And in 1901 and 1902, the Texas Company and Gulf bought 5,000 acres apiece from the Port Arthur Land Company, which, as you know, was Arthur Stillwell's development, and he named it after himself. And we all remember the story where he had the dream uh, to name the city for himself, the Brownies told him. Yes, he was originally going to go to Galveston with the railroad from Kansas City, and the Brownie told him not to do that, to come to the Sabine Natchez River, Sabine Lake, where they emptied into the Gulf. He tried to do it in Sabine Pass, and the Koontz brothers wouldn't sell him the land, so he went up to the Taylor's Bio and ended up buying 43,000 acres. Your father was selling lots in Boart Gardens. Did he also sell it in Del Mar Estates and yes. other places around town? Yes, I think at that time he was working in about five subdivisions. And uh, when I was born in 1940, we were living on King's Court, and that was in Del Mar, about a block and a half from Lee School. That uh, area developed, uh, I guess, during the Depression, uh, which was unusual that you had the expansion of the economy during the National Depression. Well, people continued to have jobs at the Texas Company and Gulf, and even though they cut salaries out there at, I think, twice, 10%, but people still had a steady job, and prices got lower. So they could afford to get a house, and my dad started building houses and ended up building over 4,000 houses. What was his first subdivision? Well, the first one... Uh, was Boulevard Courts, and then uh, Park Place was number one, and uh, then we, I guess we were not very creative with the names, but we had Park Place two and three, and then Park Place Manor. Uh, we were fortunate enough, really, because my dad was officing uh, in the 30s in the Adams Building, on the third floor, 327 was his office number. And down the hall was our state senator, Alan Shivers. And uh, they became friends because my dad was a private pilot. And uh, Alan represented the Texas company locally. And uh, because of Alan Shivers, my dad was able to buy 500 acres from the Texaco. And that started uh, about... Uh, well, 29th Street, and went north of all, all that to where that uh, Memorial Baptist Church is now. And then what was Park Place Hospital and the Driftwood in that area. And that became a very significant part of the development in Port Arthur, including the Driftwood Motel. Well, the Driftwood there. opened uh, February the 1st, 1959, and... Uh, it was, uh, my dad got a loan at Merchants Bank and uh, for 20 rooms. 
And Jack Craig came out there to do an inspection before a draw and said, Roy, there's too much plumbing here. What have you, what have you done? He said, well, with the money you're loaning me, I figured I could build 30 rooms. And that ended up being uh, 134 rooms and was a very successful uh, operation. Your dad also was involved in politics. You mentioned Alan Shivers. Uh, he served on, your dad served on the school board. Yes. My, in my, fact, your whole family had political well, my, positions. Your brother Lloyd was mayor of Port Arthur. You served on the school board. And my brother Joe served uh, on drainage district number seven board. So the family has had a long-term involvement in local politics as well as statewide. Well, in the Park Place area, uh, I remember the election was held in 1948. That was the 50th birthday of Port Arthur. And uh, my dad pushed for the Park Place area to be a part of the city of Port Arthur. And that passed. And, uh, and in 1949, he was elected to the school board and kind of show you how things have changed. My brother Joe married a school teacher in 1957, and my dad resigned because he thought there might be kind of some kind of conflict. Of course, there wasn't because she was already an employee of the district, but that's the, that was his thinking, and uh, he did a he did a great job. And and one thing that I'm proud of that he worked on and and eventually got it passed that minority teachers in Port Arthur through his work and, and a lot of help from others, they were paid on an equal basis. And that was before the 1954 Brown decision. Alan Shivers uh, distinguished himself in many ways. I guess uh, with the Interstate Commerce Commission, uh, he had a lot of impact on business, uh, in all, all the states. Uh, was your family's association with him important in the development of the projects you had in mind? Well, it certainly was that uh, my dad was able to buy this 500 acres from, from the Texas company. My dad was a private pilot and had flown out to take Governor, Lieutenant Governor Shivers to Lubbock, Texas to crown Miss West Texas. That was a big deal back then. And uh, they got word that Buford Jester had died, the governor. So my dad flew him back home and uh, a few days later, uh, which our family went to the inauguration, or not the inauguration, well it is an inauguration, he, he uh, took the oath of office in Woodville, Texas. Which was his birthplace. Yes. And of course, Alan Shivers' uh, family had a relationship in Port Arthur, and we can talk about it, but Alan Shivers went to the 12th grade here. And Port Arthur was the first school district in Texas to have 12 grades. And the way that came about in 1926, uh, the Texas company in Gulf went to the school board and said, we're having trouble uh, recruiting engineers and we need to improve the school system. The Port Arthur school system hired uh, Columbia University and it took three years of study. Uh, the University of Texas had about 10 percent of that but Columbia was known as the best educational uh, school in the country at that time. They proposed 19 items and the Port Arthur school district uh, passed 16 of them, and that included the 12th grade, the first one in Texas. It included department heads, where a department head would only teach two classes and do curriculum and be sure the other teachers, the other part of the time, knew what they were doing and how they were teaching. Uh, it was just, we had the reputation of being the finest school district in Texas, and we paid the best salaries. So that, that really improved the ability uh, to recruit uh, 
uh, qualified engineers because engineers are very important in running these refineries. Was Franklin School constructed as a result of that study? No, it was actually done before that. And, and my memory is it opened in 1916. And it was shown to be the finest school in Texas. With an indoor swimming pool. Yes. And then an area on the roof where you could grow plants. And it was a fine, had a fine auditorium. And Sam, I'm jumping way ahead. But the school that you graduated from in 1960, well, actually it was the next fall, the new Thomas Jefferson opened on Twin City. And its picture was on the cover of Life magazine as the finest high school, new high school in the country. And that was a very novel design, too, as I remember. Yeah. With heaters on the ceiling, <laughs> a lot of other things that were new, like uh, ventilation through the halls and under right. the walls. In uh, that opened in 1960, and we really didn't start air conditioning schools in Texas to 1966. So it was, a, it was a good design for the time, and we later had a bond issue in 73 to air condition all the schools that weren't air conditioned, and uh, that passed and was done uh, while I was on the school board. And that was a great advancement at that time. One way we talked about school and education and your family's involvement is very evident and appreciated there. We have to talk about sports, though, when you talk about high school. Uh, high school football is such a big part of our cultural life here and has been for decades. Yes. Uh, I, you knew some of the great people associated with it or were acquainted with them. Well, let me, let me back up just a minute that uh, one reason – the way hiring was done at, at the two refineries in the 20s and 30s, they would, people would line up at the gate and the people from the human resources would pick out the big ones because they were moving around 55 gallon drums full of oil. So you had to be big and strong. So these big and strong guys had big children and they were important for football. Uh, it was a big deal that we mentioned Franklin School. The state championship of Texas was played on the Franklin School field in uh, 1919. Uh, I'll, I'll jump forward. Uh, we tied in 29, 30, and 31. We tied for the state championship. We won the state championship and we lost the state championship three years in a row. And one that would be interesting to folks, we played up in Breckenridge, Texas, and which was an oil town, had great football team. And uh, there's a great story about it. The Port Arthur team went on the train up there to play. And uh, that's west of Fort Worth. And it snowed and there was about 12 inches of snow on the field and it turned out to be a zero zero tie. Uh, on Franklin Field, Port Arthur used to play Beaumont High on Thanksgiving. That's a big, that was a big deal. Uh, one of the, the football teams were good and all the way through. And my first memory was in 48 when Jack Day was the great running back and we got beat at Waco in the semifinals in 49. Ken Cannon was a quarterback for Waco and ended up winning the state championship. But uh, nobody thought there would be a better ball player than, than Jack Day as a running back. The very next year uh, was 49 and Frank Adam was a junior, and he became an all-state running back. Uh, he tried to go out for football, 
at Woodrow Wilson in the eighth grade. He was too small. They, they wouldn't let him go out. He was very disappointed. He had a friend that was a cook on Proctor Street, a block from the junior high, at the Southerner. He would go over there with his sandwich. The guy would give him three cheeseburgers, a loaf of bread, and two quarts of milk every day at lunch. He actually, I don't know the proper word, he made his stomach bigger. He always had a, people thought he was fat. He wasn't fat, he just had distended his stomach. <laughs> and uh, he was able to go out in the ninth grade. But this great football player in the eighth grade, they would not let him go out for football because he was too small. I first met him Christmas parade for Port Arthur, which was on Proctor Street. And I can remember meeting him over on Woodworth. No, excuse me, not Woodworth, Stillwell. And I was uh, 10 years old, and he was a, a senior in high school. And so he was, a, my oldest brother Joe had graduated in 50, and they were friends, and then Lloyd graduated in 53, and Frank took a liking also to Lloyd. Well, I met him that day, and of course I was in all because I'd been to all those high school ball games. That's one thing my dad and family, we always went to these high school games. And uh, so Frank was all state, one of the top running backs, I mean, uh, of the type, Joe Washington from Lincoln. I mean, this was a great running back. He got a scholarship to uh, SMU. And back then, you had freshman teams. And that team was only doing so-so. I think they were three and three. And the coach was very worried about playing Oklahoma as the freshman team. Frank went in to see the coach and said, Coach, I don't, I don't want you to worry about this game. We're going to beat Oklahoma. Well, they ended up, Frank scored four touchdowns, and they beat Oklahoma. And that, that freshman coach was the freshman coach at SMU for 25 years. He thought Frank Adam was the best running back he ever had. Of course, at SMU, he was uh, named All-American. Well, he was a friend of my brother's, and uh, this happened five or six times. He would come by our house on Memorial and ask my mother, you know, if Joe or Lloyd were at home. And, and I, they weren't hunted home, but he'd say, well, Jeff, you want to go with me to go work out? And they would, we would go down to the, what is now, uh, what it became, it was Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Edison on 12th Street. And he would do sprints, 20-yard sprints. And he would do them for about an hour and a half straight. I mean, he would just line up, run 20 yards, turn around, run 20 yards. He would do it until he dropped. And after about the third time, I went with him over there, and he would do this every time. I would say, Frank, why do you do that? And he said, I want to be in, as good in the fourth quarter as I am in the first quarter. He, uh, as I said, he was All-American. The Korean War was going on. Everybody was drafted or had to go into the service. Well, they realized that he was a great ball player. And each Army base had a team. And he played for Fort Sam Houston. And Fort... Sam uh, probably had the best team in the country. And the generals of each base really thought this was important. And they went up to play at Colleen at Fort Hood. And Frank, they beat Fort Hood. And he told his other team members that after the ball game, he said, I'm going to Fort Arthur to see my mother. And he had just signed with the, the Philadelphia Eagles. They'd paid him a signing bonus of $19,000. 
which was big money back then. And uh, so he left uh, Colleen and Fort Hood by himself. I think he had a Pontiac automobile and uh, was in a one-car accident. They didn't find him for 24 hours. He was still alive, but not conscious. They took him to Brook Army Medical Hospital at Fort Sam, which was the finest military hospital in, next to Walter Reed in the country. And he lived for additional four days. I had another friend from Port Arthur who was a, uh, also a football player who was in the Army and was sick, but he was at, on the same floor. And he said, I went to see Frank twice a day, but he never regained consciousness and, and died uh, at the hospital there at Fort Sam. He was a legendary player, and you mentioned Little Joe, and of course Jamal Charles, that broken field running back was just not the standard at the time Frank Item played. I can tell a story. When I was in junior high school, the coaches would assemble all the boys at the beginning of the school year and show them film footage of Frank Item carrying the ball, which was an amazing thing to see. And the question would be, can any of you boys do what that guy just did on the screen? And we all thought we could, but no one could. No. He just was a unique player and ahead of his time, really, in football. Do you remember if the crowds that were drawn to see those games, I remember hearing that there may have been 50,000 people see him play in Corpus Christi. You think that's possible? Yes, it's possible. Now, the, the stadium on, uh, out on Twin City, uh, which is called Memorial Stadium today, uh, held 20,000. And when he was playing out there, they would line up, have 5,000 people there without seats. They would put 25,000 people in that. But we played down at Corpus. And uh, that story was out that there were 50,000 people. Uh, I think we played Miller down there. And let me, let me remind you, in the, in the late 40s, early 50s, uh, we would play the, what was considered, when Frank was playing, the best team in Louisiana, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. Capitol Hill was the best football team in Oklahoma. We would play them. They would either come here or we would go there. Pine Bluff, Arkansas was the best team in Arkansas. We would play them. Astroma was the best team in Baton Rouge or the whole state of Louisiana. We would play them. And normally we won. And in the late 40s, early 50s, the first game of the season for Port Arthur was Odessa. Odessa was the best team in West Texas, and we would fly out there for the first game of the season. The next year, they would fly to Port Arthur. It was a major production. So we're, this was big-time football. And before the NFL had the status that it currently enjoys today, and many of the college teams didn't play as good a brand of football as you would see at a high school game. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, all of the schools here, Stephen F. Austin, Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson, they've all had ball players in the pros. And, uh, the, you know, we, we won the state championship. I know there are some other times, but uh, I can remember hearing about the 1944 game. Uh, we played Highland Park, and Dote Walker was the, great running back that played at Highland Park High School and then SMU and then the Detroit Lions. Uh, he wrote a book about his career in football and he said the toughest game he ever played was against the Port Arthur Yellow Jackets. And we had a little guy named Guatemala, 145 pounds, that lined up at defensive end and Coach Dennis told him, you hit this guy, Dope Walker, every time. No matter whether he's got the ball or not, you tackle him. In the second quarter, he broke Dope Walker's arm, and Dope Walker continued to play. It, uh, so, and then that was 44. 
Uh, I talked about 48 uh, in, let's see, we played for the state championship in 1957 against Highland Park again at the stadium on Twin City. At that game, I think uh, there were 30,000 people at this state championship. We lost because our quarterback, Ronnie Stanley, got his arm broken, and uh, Wendell Hebert came in. He was just a sophomore. But uh, we lost that ball game, and then in the 1980, we played uh, Permian out of Odessa in the Cowboy Stadium, and that's the one, the stadium that had the hole in the top. It was 18 degrees at kickoff, and it got colder. At halftime, we were winning that ball game, but we ended up losing the state championship. And a, and a guy that's been very innovative uh, was Ronnie Thompson, and we could talk about that in another time, but he really changed high school football. And today, people talk about great quarterbacks coming out of Texas and being in the NFL. Well, Ronnie Thompson and Todd Dodge had a lot to do with that. They really opened the game up with the passing game and the long ball. Uh, Brent Duhon was a favorite receiver. He was. As I remember. Just a couple of footnotes. You mentioned Greenville and you mentioned Breckenridge. And um, the Greenville game, as you mentioned, was played at Franklin School. And there was the disputed uh, game at the end. The Houston and Beaumont papers had Port Arthur winning the ball game, and the Greenville paper had Greenville winning the ball game. So it wound up uh, uncertain uh, as to who the winner was. 1,500 people were there to see it. So they just add some more color to what is the most colorful history of Port Arthur football. And in that 1929 game, you mentioned the snowstorm. The game ended with Port Arthur holding Breckenridge on the one-yard line. They couldn't get in to score. And then, as you probably recall, after your, before, this is before your time on the school board, Breckenridge petitioned the school board to play a, another game to decide the game to select a winner, and Port Arthur declined. Okay, another thing that I talked about, the big people that went to work to Texaco and Gov. Another thing, we had good high school coaches, and this happened a lot. You would have to pay a good coach, high school coach, a lot of money. They didn't want the principal to make less money so we had to raise the salaries of the principal where the principal would be the highest paid in the building. But we were paying big money uh, for a high school coach. Buckshot uh, would be one of those, I guess. And, and Tom, Tom Dennis. Dennis was the, the great one. The great one. Uh, and then Smitty Hill and Ronnie Thompson. Yeah. And that list goes on from there. Right. It's an amazing history. Let's, let's talk about the James Commission. Tom James was a state representative from the Dallas area and came and conducted uh, hearings here on crime, co corruption, principally gambling and uh, prostitution, uh, as well as drug dealing. And Port Arthur had a bad reputation and image as sort of a sin city at that time in the uh, middle 50s. His uh, commission exposed the corruption that was ingrained here, which brought about change. Do you have any recollections of that time? Yes, uh, I do. Jefferson County was considered wide open. Uh, there were at least 20 houses of prostitution in Port Arthur, uh, probably more. And uh, Beaumont had at least 14. Uh, 
you could, Texas did not allow liquor by the drink, but you could get liquor or beer in a house of ill repute any place in Jefferson County. Uh, the uh, sheriff was Charlie Meyer, and his bumper sticker said, everybody's sheriff. So Tom James, uh, as you mentioned, was a state rep from Dallas. Uh, he wanted to be attorney general. And he thought he didn't make it, but he thought this was a way to get himself elected attorney general. Uh, I was in school up in Austin at the time when I came home uh, Thanksgiving of 1960. Things were wide open. And some people said, and I, I think there's a lot of truth in that, sometimes the best minds in Port Arthur were trying to figure out how to cut up that pie that this illegal activity produced. Uh, so when, when I came home for Christmas, things were tighter than a tick, Christmas 1960. Tom James had his hearings in January of 1961, and it was on television, live, and most housewives in Jefferson County did not know most of the things that were going on. And uh, I asked a Port Arthur policeman who was pretty high up, who had retired, I asked D.P. Moore one day, I said, uh, who was the first gambler in Port Arthur? And he said, well, the first postmaster. So it, you know, Port Arthur, Arthur still, well, this was before Spindletop. This was going to be a resort. I mean, there was a hotel right where the sub courthouse is. We had sandy beaches. There wasn't Pleasure Island. Uh, so it was going to be a resort. And then a little bit further tonight, uh, up the road, maybe six miles, we were, we were going to grow rice. And then in January the 10th, 1901, Spindletop came in and changed the world. And led to the industrial development that affected the lake and the environment. Uh, we always hear the stories about, you mentioned the sandy beaches and the clear water, fresh water in Lake Sabine. And then as the canal was dredged, there was no retaining levees at that time. And all that spoil went in the water it went into Lake Sabine and right created, Lake Sabine. Uh, created Pleasure Island. Uh, Arthur Stilwell brought a canal up to Taylor's Bow. He started, uh, I think, in 1895 or thereabouts, and he got that thing finished about 1897. And one of the first uh, things that were built, actually the, the KCS, uh, built a grain elevator out of native pine. And it was all out of wood and, and tin on the outside. But uh, some of the first things with grain uh, coming down from the middle America on the KCS railroad and would go out by, by ship. And you mentioned that grain elevator and that wood was so beautiful. Uh, much of it wound up in Austin in the state capital uh, in the underground development there when that expansion was done. And so you'll see that paneling and the walls and the molding that came from that grain elevator. It's an amazing, uh, amazing story, really. Yes, it is. Well, we've talked about a lot, a lot of Port Arthur history and this area's history. Uh, what do you think about the future? As you look forward, uh, based on what you've seen, we've been through floods and hurricanes, and now we're in a pandemic. How do you think we're going to fare for the future? Well, there, there is some uncertainty. Uh, last year, uh, we had on the books uh, over $100 billion worth of construction that was going to take place in our area. Some of that is now on hold. 
some of it is proceeding. Uh, so far, there hasn't been a major project canceled, but we already have a LNG plant, even though it's in Louisiana, it's eight miles from downtown Port Arthur. One of the major, uh, when it was built, it was the largest private construction job in the United States going on. Number two was the Chevron Phillips plant at Baytown, which was built originally by Gulf Oil. And uh, we have two, they're doing the dirt and rock work on the expansion of uh, Golden Pass. We have an import facility out there, but because of shale, the whole world's changed, and now we have excess gas that we can send around the world. So they're redoing that plant right now. That's a, approximately a $12 billion job. Uh, Sempra right now is uh, moving Highway 87 from south of the Intercoastal Canal to, to Keith Lake and that's under construction. They have a uh, timetable of January of 2021 to make a final investment decision on that. Uh, Valero has two expansion things going on right now. Uh, Total is finishing up one uh, that's very important. Uh, and the big kicker should be Motiva, and they want to do at least two chemical plants and uh, they just uh, bought out the uh, plant that they originally built on Savannah that was the largest olefant unit in the world. Uh, they bought it from Flint Hills and that's now an integral part of the refinery. So I think our future is bright. We've had a little bit of setback. No one expected this thing that hit us uh, in the first quarter of 2020, but uh, hopefully uh, some of these investments will continue. Uh, and it's very important. Exxon Mobil has slowed up their big expansion of their refinery uh, right south of downtown Beaumont. Will you comment on the Motiva investment in downtown Port Arthur and buying uh, buildings that had been vacant yes. for many years? Uh, Motiva has bought the Adams Building, which was a six-story building uh, built by John R. Adams, opened in 1926. It was the finest uh, office building in downtown. Uh, it became the World Trade Building when we had a public port, a new public port in 1963. Uh, they're completely, it's under construction right now, they're completely redoing that building. Uh, across the street was the post office. It was actually, some people called it the federal building too because all the federal offices were in there. They're redoing that. Uh, and A.E. Scott Furniture, they bought that and redoing that. They're considering buying the Sabine Hotel as well as the health department, which is where the Merchants National Bank was for many years. So it's... Uh, they're going to have at least 500 people downtown Port Arthur. This is a, a real game changer, and uh, we just hope things will get back on track, and we're fortunate that they're uh, actively working on these buildings now and uh, will do these other buildings, uh, at least we hope so. Some of the old-timers always felt that if downtown had been better tied with industry buildings, that it would have fared better and would not have deteriorated uh, so badly as it as it did. Uh, I, I know that had there been the stability of a Texaco building or a Motiva building, uh, it would have certainly kept the traffic good uh, for the small businesses that were located there. Yeah, I, I can remember 1948 coming to downtown Port Arthur and actually going into the Adams building and uh, they had a little diner right there on the first floor. And uh, it was so crowded. This was Christmas, Christmas time, 1948. You could not find a parking place. And in the, even in the 30s, it got so crowded 
that Texaco played, paid one Friday and Gulf would pay the next Friday because if they paid everyone at the same time, it would be too much traffic in downtown Port Arthur. Speaking of downtown, uh, I know you probably remember Jake Pickle, the congressman from the Austin area, who was uh, in advertising. He was the producer of the uh, film, The Port Arthur Story. Do you remember that? Yes, uh, that was done to help Alan Shivers get reelected. And as I remember, he was running against Ralph Yarbrough for governor. Shivers was running for re-election. I remember seeing the film and uh, I knew Pickle a little bit when I was up in Austin in school. Uh, it was unfortunate that that was done, but uh, I think it did help Shivers get re-elected. As I remember, the issue was uh, labor management and, and the unions uh, were taking control of the plants which affected the cities where they were located um, I asked Pickle about it, and because there's one scene in the movie, I'd seen the movie also, where you went down Proctor Street with a camera, and all the buildings said closed. And so they were trying to make the point that the unions, the strike was killing the town, and there needed to be some counterweight uh, where labor and management could address an issue or a dispute without affecting local business. And I ask you, well, how did you get a, a scene like that in that day and time? Because there, was no, there were no special effects. He said on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, we just drove down Proctor Street, and all the stores had a closed sign in the window. And that's how we got it. Yes, and that was, as I remember, uh, around 1953. Yes. And uh, the new Sears store on Woodworth opened in 1954. And as you remember, they were on the first floor of the Adams Building. Yes. And then in 56, uh, Jefferson City opened. And Penny's was at 617 Proctor. And they moved out uh, as the south anchor of, of Jefferson City. So right there, 53, 54, 56, uh, the, uh, the major retailers started moving out. But you still had the population base here, 66,000 on the 1960 census. Uh, interestingly, that compares to Las Vegas that had the same identical population, 66,000 in 1960. Uh, and yet the development there uh, took on a huge impact, made a huge impact on the entire state of Nevada, but we didn't get the same opportunity here for developing and expanding the base that was already here. Well, Sam, as you remember, uh, when we were in high school, uh, Texaco had 6,000 employees and Gulf had 5,500 employees. Uh, when I would come home from school in the summer, uh, I was working at Port Arthur Abstract, but on Saturday night, I'd let the, the desk clerk have a night off, and I would do the night audit. Well, a guy came up in a suit, nice tie, and you, you didn't see that too much in Port Arthur. I mean, this is a working man's town, really. And uh, I said, sir, who, who are you with? if I may ask, and he said, well, I'm with McKenzie and company out of Boston. I said, well, what are you doing here? He said, well, we're going to see how we can reduce employment at the Texas company. By that time, it was called Texaco. And uh, so with, with automation, that has really affected us. Uh, and one of our... Uh, Good employers had laborers working, in addition to those 6,000 people, 800 people out there, laborers working every day. So uh, it's the world, we had automation in these refineries, 
And today, Motiva has roughly 1,100 people. Uh, Valero has roughly 900 people. Now, they have a lot of contract people, but uh, that's a lot of difference. Well, the employment base just shrunk yeah. at a time uh, that affected the community in so many significant ways. In 1970, the Port Arthur census showed a drop of 10,000 residents. So national policies, federal policies, the Civil Rights Act of 1965, so many things influenced and impacted Port Arthur, its housing patterns, employment opportunities, it just so many things that couldn't be overcome, really. Right. Now today, very important is the, is the construction employment. I mean, if all of these uh, construction jobs, we could have in excess of 20,000 people working here easily in the next few years. Of course, those are, those are not full-time permanent jobs. Those people are in here for two to four years, but uh, we need construction to make this thing home. Well, and you've got, what, at least two uh, motels, multi-story buildings under construction. Many of those workers find housing uh, in the motel inventory. Well, to use a different term, it's kind of our man camp. Man camp? Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> Jeff, have we left anything out today that you'd like to talk about? Well, you know, sometimes people talk about why Port Arthur has uh, developed so many good people. It goes back to their parents having good jobs and having a great educational basis. So people were able to get an education here, probably one of the best in the country. We have to agree with you, and Park Place has quite a legacy, the people who grew up in Park Place, the multiple Park Place developments have gone on to great accomplishments in Texas, in the nation, and around the world. We thank you and your great family for so many significant advancements that you made possible by your investments here. Well, thank you very much. About 57, we started in the Stonegate Park Central area, and uh, that's when we eventually had uh, 6,000 acres out there, and uh, we'll talk about that another day. Thanks for saving another subject for another time.